Speaking of leadership, let's go to Dr. Bridge Bombi of Centric Health. Mr. Bombi, Dr. Bombi, how are you, sir? Richard, I'm well. How are you? I'm well. I could be better. I'm, I, I, I must say, Dr. Bombi, I'm glad you're on because I'm just a layman here, right? I'm just a, a history major. I'm not a trained medical professional like you are. But when I heard Russell Judd of Kern Medical say that the system, the hospitals in the greater Bakersfield area are near or at or near capacity, it distressed me in a way that I can't even describe because what it said to me is selfishly, number one, if I come down uh, with this virus, they might not be room at the end for me. And number two, it says something that somehow we're failing. Uh, we're failing ourselves and the community and our fellow uh, men and women because somehow we're still, uh, this thing is still spreading despite uh, you know, d despite at least my best efforts, when you look at that and where we are now here on the 24th day of July, we're almost into August. You remember this thing, I, I, I can remember back in early March, I thought this thing would be gone for sure by June. Where are we now? And, and give me some hope here, Dr. Bami. Uh, I don't remember discussing, Richard, that uh, this thing will be gone by June uh, in March. That was, mi that was my best hopes. Yeah. <laughs> so because, uh, you know, the, the virus is uh, omnipresent and the vulnerability also is omnipresent, even though uh, maybe 8 or 10% of the population have had the infection. And uh, we uh, well know that the herd immunity can't be achieved till we have 60, 70% of the population with the virus and uh, antibodies. Uh, having uh, uh, said that, it's really disheartening uh, that we have a very good understanding of the behavior of the virus, and still we didn't adapt our behaviors to defeat the virus. We acted the other way around. Now, there is, a, there is an easy explanation that uh, humans uh, love social experiences and social interactions, but those are the same settings the virus yearns for, and virus is, will, uh, is winning because we didn't elect to do the right things. Mm. So when we, and you're, are you talking about the basic right things, the wearing the mask, the social distancing, uh, uh, is, are, are there things more than that we should be doing? Uh, those are the things. We know the strike zone of the virus. You know, it has three feet or six feet. If you maintain distance, if you separate yourself from others, Richard, when we use the flattening as a tool, what was the, the, flat, the, the lockdown was essentially keeping distance between mm. people so the virus doesn't jump from one person to another and limiting the size of the crowds. That was lockdown. And the release from lockdown was contingent upon continuing to practice those tools to prevent the exponential growth of the virus. It's not rocket science. It's simple. You know, what, Hygiene and distance. Hygiene and distance. I mean, if, if it were only so simple, if we would just listen. Uh, Dr. Bombi, you're obviously associated with, with uh, Heart Hospital. I hear that we're losing a lot of hospital prof uh, professionals to the virus itself, that there's staffing shortages. How critical is that system-wide, the shortages? And is it because that so many of our professionals have contracted the virus or uh, were they laid off earlier and got other jobs? Why are we so short right now? Uh, three things. One, in this town, it's actually around the country, we always, always have had a uh, scarcity of healthcare providers, nurses, technicians, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, second, a bunch of the, the nurses and healthcare providers have been uh, inflicted by the virus, and every, any time a person has infection, they have to go out by 10, or 10 days to two weeks. Uh, 10 days according to the CDC current recommendation, 14 days according to previous recommendations. 
So that creates a dent in already uh, scarce commodity. Mm. And uh, uh, the, the, the other thing is uh, the physical structure. Even though we have plenty of IC beds and uh, regular beds, if they're not staffed, they don't really count for anything. Yeah. The scarcity of staff is the bottlenecking. Also, uh, the, it's like deja vu all over again. Uh, the PPE scarcity, uh, the gloves, the N95s, th- those things never end. It's uh, um, like a recurring nightmare that the scarcity of protective equipment is, in, is coming back to us. Uh, it, it's um, somewhat distressing and incomprehensible, but it's the reality. I mean, is, why is that? We've known about these. I mean, when you talk about scarcity, are you talking about like just basic PPP equipment, shields, face guards, masks, gloves, uh, gowns, those type of things? Uh, that and uh, uh, also the testing site, for instance, you know, the, the whole assembly line, sometimes the swabs are not there, sometimes the chemical agents mm. are not there, no, the pipettes are not there. So it, it's like, a coordinated, comprehensive approach that addresses all aspects is lacking. So mm. it's broken at one place or another and continuously uh, stretching the demand and supply equation. God, that's great. So uh, what, 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 is, what is the go-to for hospitals here or anywhere when you run out of nurses because uh, I mean, you've got the beds but you don't have the staff? Uh, where do you go? And I, 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 I know about traveling nor- nurses, but is, is where's the pool of professionals that you can just contract with to bring in? So under the CARES Act, there was allocation of some funds for, for the hotspots to hire nurses and the technical staff from across the state in other parts of the country. And that's what we're doing now. We're using the CARES Act funding to hire nurses from other parts of the country. Like uh, previously, California offered a lot to New York when New York was in crunch. Right. So it's, it's the, the reverse of that. But the question you asked, Richard, uh, that what happens if you or somebody you know has COVID? Uh-huh. That's only part of the question. The other part is what happens to all the non-COVID care? Uh-huh. COVID is not the only sickness. So what happens is when uh, the COVID consumes all the beds, it creates two things. One, it, limi- it, it eliminates the capacity to do other things for non-COVID patients. Two, the non-COVID patients get scared and they don't even seek the health care. Right, right. So we have paid the price in New York. We have paid the price all over the world that the non-COVID-related deaths and sickness shoots up. God, Lord, I, I didn't even think about that. So are you talking about uh, other, you know, what, what might be considered normal procedures, a heart stent or, or any of those kind of, they're not elective surgeries, so to speak, but are those being postponed now or are there just fewer of them being done? Uh, more than likely, a lot of them will be postponed as uh, uh, we go deeper into this crisis. But the, the, the trouble with it is that people who have heart attacks and strokes, there was an incredible paradox that suddenly the STEMIs or acute heart attacks and strokes plummeted in numbers. What happened was those numbers translated into deaths. The people then show up in the hospital and elected to die at home being scared uh, of exposure to the virus. Yeah. So we have, when we, when we don't behave, when we create this preventable stress on the healthcare, we not only kill people from COVID unnecessarily, a preventable death, we also ascribe people with other sicknesses to a mortal outcome that could have been easily uh, avoidable also. So it all goes back to our behavior. Oh, we can, we yeah. can uh, like we did in the lockdown, we can in three to four weeks, if we change our behavior now, we'll see the results, which will be positive. But if we don't, it's a problem. 
Oh, boy. Talk to Dr. Bridge Bomb. If you have a question for him, 842-5376. We'll take your calls here. You can message JR at 661-842-5376. You can read your message to Dr. Bombi here. Dr. Bombi, a lot of us are putting a lot of hope on a vaccine. And yet, uh, occasionally I'll hear somebody was quoting Bill Gates as saying, well, these vaccines sometimes it'll take you one or two or three different vaccines to get it right. What are we looking at in these vaccines, assuming that, I mean, is this something like a lottery? You just hope that the the first one to get there will do the best job? Or are we planning to have different redundant back vaccines what i'm not even sure how vaccines work and how what what is the efficacy rating on a vaccine what you know what what is considered a really effective vaccine bring us up to date on that vaccine is a, an infection that doesn't cause the infection but creates immunity so basically you have attenuated the infected component of the virus that has been a traditional approach in, in the viruses, in the vaccines. But now, in addition to the, the traditional approach, there is a genetically engineered approach in which they take this uh, messenger RNA or a genetic uh, component of the virus, and that's injected in the body. And that mimics the effect of, of an infection or the, I would call it antigen, that will arouse a safety response called immune response and build immunity. Uh, the hope there is, if you use the genetic uh, uh, engineering, then the scalability will be much better, uh, and uh, the production, mass production, would be a lot easier, so we'll have a larger uh, dosages available for the population as la- at large. Uh, but the vaccines are riding on the hope that the immunity will be effective and durable. So far, all we know is that there are not too many people who have had a second infection with the virus. So, but the, the length, time length is only six months. So all we can say is if a person has an infection, there's less likelihood of that person being infected again in six months. What happens eight months later, or 10 months mm-hmm. later, 12 months later, we don't know yet. It's quite conceivable that when, uh, when a vaccine is available, it may need to be repeated every six months or so. It may need a booster dose. Uh, but more importantly, understand the, uh, the vaccine is not a panacea in the sense that it can be created and immediately available to the large sections of the society. There are many bottlenecks. Even if the vaccine is attractive and durable, those bottlenecks include, one, acceptance by the society, two, the vials, the needles, the syringes, three, the um, uh, formidable challenge of uh, production at that scale. Then as the, 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 the vaccine is being made available, how is it staggered in different sections of the population, maybe the healthcare first, the uh, nursing homes next, and stuff like that, and military next, things like that. So there are a lot of unanswered questions that range from can the vaccine be made to the length of time or timeline when it's going to be available, to its efficacies, to its durability, to its uh, logistical challenges of uh, volumes and uh, dispersion and injecting, and then the social uh, question of uh, anti-vacciners accepting, not accepting. If 30%, 40% people don't accept, you still don't achieve the herd immunity. You lower the spread oh. rate, but you don't uh, achieve the herd immunity. So a lot of interesting and complex challenges about. Have, uh, Dr. Bamu, have we ever had a situation in the modern world where virtually the entire world, I don't even know what the population of the world is, 7 billion people or something like that, I don't know, uh, is is waiting on one vaccine. And how in the world do you, you, you just address some of those issues like who's first in line? Uh, who, you know, healthcare professionals or essential workers or or whatever. And what country is first? I mean, we have a global pandemic waiting on a vaccine 
how have we ever had a situation where we had to scale the production up to meet that kind of demand? There was a, a threat in 1976, I think, when uh, Ford was the president. There was a threat about uh, pig uh, or uh, flu. Uh, and uh, at the time, there was uh, some scalability component involved. And actually, if I remember, Gerald Ford actually was vaccinated in the White House. But at the end of the day, that vaccine produced Ganbury syndrome and some other side effects, mm. and, uh, and the flu never came. Uh, so that was kind of a micro version, but at a global level, no. This is our first chance, and uh, you know, one could say that uh, we have screwed it early. Oh boy, oh boy. Uh, final question here: When when you talked about earlier, re, you used a. Uh, you said a reluctance to take the vaccine. Now, I'm assuming you're talking about people who are who are against vaccines, the anti-vaxxers. And then you threw out, you said, you said, if 30 to 40 percent of the population is when people talk about the percentage of the let's just use the United States, the U.S. population, which is reluctant to be vaccinated for for anything. How high a number is that? Do we what what the studies show? The current numbers are about 20 to 25 percent are adamantly opposed. About 30 to 31 percent are unsure of it. So if you have 50 percent of the people who, for one reason or another, uh, won't take it or consider about it, uh, that's a lot of people who won't accept the vaccine. And that that reduces the expected positive outcome related to the vaccine. So is is it possible to get to herd immunity when you have 30% of the population not participating? If that was the only way to develop herd immunity, no. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if 30 to 50%. So if you have, so there are two kinds of herd immunities, Richard. One is vaccine related. That's the best kind of herd immunity because there is no downside to the virus if the vaccine is safe. The second is infection related. Uh, the trouble with infection related is there are some people who are going to have bad consequences, including death. Right. Uh, the, 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 the hybrid approach, uh, I have convinced myself uh, as the best strategy is based on the fact that there will be some anti-vaccineers and also how long are we going to stay under the rock? We have to practice safety measures and have a control, a control the spread of the virus to the healthier segment of the people population who will are less likely to have bad consequences. So that builds a component of the herd immunity. Then vaccine builds another component of the herd immunity. Then we have pharmaceuticals that help deal with sicker aspects of the disease. And we have a, a kind of a, a, a mixed approach, a hybrid approach that addresses ultimately the threat of the virus. Oh, boy, man, it's complicated. we got a long way to go here. All right, well, Dr. Bridge Bombay, he joins us every Friday from Centric Health and Heart Hospital. He's a cardiologist in town. You've been so valuable during this pandemic to break things down in a way that we can all understand it. Dr. Bombay, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I want you to be safe, my friend. Stay safe, Richard. You too. Okay, you too. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that.